We are thrilled <laughs> to welcome Markus on the occasion of the publication of this amazing book, which uh, you can also, after the you know, talk, get outside and you can get it signed by Markus. The Creativity Code, How AI is Learning to Write, Paint and Think. Uh, Markus, of course, needs no introduction. He's the Simone Professor of Public Understanding of Science, the really public face of science in uh, this country and the globally well-known mathematician, professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford, and also the author of many books, such as The Music of the Primes, Finding Moonshine, Symmetry, A Journey into the Patterns of Nature, The Number Eight Mysteries, A Mathematical Odyssey Through Everyday Life, what we cannot know and how to count on infinity, which came out in 2017. A short book. A short book, but a very interesting book actually to reread in the context of this uh, AI book. He's also presented a lot of TV series. And of course, very importantly for The Serpentine, uh, we have this immense pleasure to have Marcus as our science advisor. To, you know, we do this annual festival of, uh, of basically knowledge, where we bring around the theme, scientists, artists, architects together. Markus has actually participated in nine marathons since uh, 2010. So he is the uh, participant with most marathons. There is no marathon without Markus de Sotoy, the map marathon, the initial uh, marathon of interviews, the, the, the memory marathon, the 89 plus marathon, the extinction marathon, the transformation marathon, the miracle marathon, uh, the work marathon, and very relevant for the theme tonight, the guest ghost host a machine marathon, which of course is the marathon we did about artificial intelligence, uh, in which Marcus made an amazing contribution, uh, and where he actually did one of these wonderful public experiments and be prepared, because this is not only going to be an interview, but at a certain point, which Marcus will choose, this will then also become a big experiment we are all going to do together, some Turing tests and other things, other surprises Marcus has uh, <laughs> prepared. Uh, and of course, The Creativity Code uh, is an exciting book because it's uh, exciting because it examines the, the nature of creativity as well as actually providing a, you know, a guide into how algorithms work, and we will hear a lot about this uh, from Marcus tonight, and it's interesting, you know, because I grew up in Switzerland, uh, and as a teenager, becoming very obsessed, you know, with art and by art, I, you know, initially encountered art through the long, thin figures of, um, of Giacometti, but then it was particularly Paul Klee, the great artist, the great artist Paul Klee, and the, his museum, basically, the amazing collection in Bern, uh, which basically inspired me and brought me to art. And Paul Klee always said, art's role is to make the invisible visible. And in a way, you know, I think it's fascinating that that's again the case today because we are surrounded by these invisible you know, algorithms. And uh, it's, it's in a way extremely timely that Marcus has written this book. As you will see in, in the book, art plays a big role. And also some of the collaborations we've had, because we invited Marcus to write on our Gerhard Richter exhibition, which was actually an early experiment with algorithms, because Gerhard Richter did an entire exhibition at the Serpentine based on, uh, on algorithms. Um, we will have an exhibition of Hito Steyer soon at the Serpentine, which again will have to do with algorithms, which, make, which has to do with making the invisible visible. Uh, and it has also got to do with, of course, these new experiments in art and technology, which we proclaim that uh, at the Serpentine, together with our teams, with Jana Peel, our CEO, Ben Vickers, our CTO, um, uh, Ben is an artist, uh, a writer, and you know, as we believe in the artist placement group idea of Barbara Stavili and Sean Latham, uh, Jana and I felt it's important as an art institution to have a chief technology officer, uh, and to have that chief technology officer actually in the position of an artist, which we think is very exciting. And so we proclaimed the, 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 the kind of manifesto of need. So we want at the Serpentine to have need, not eat, because eat is Billy <coughs> Kluver who in the 60s you know, proclaimed the experiments in art and technology. And we think it's time for new experiments in art and technology. And I was rereading the other day the book of Marshall McLuhan, Understanding Media, which noted the ability of art to anticipate the future social and also technological development. Art is an early alarm system, McLuhan writes, pointing us to new developments in times ahead and allowing us to prepare to cope with them. 
art as a radar environment takes on the function, function of indispensable perceptual training. And these are, of course, remarks McLuhan made in 1964 when the book was first published. And that's also the year when the Korean artist Nam Joon Paik was just building his robot K456 to experiment with the technology to later on influence society. He had worked with television, challenging its usual passive consumption by the viewer, and made art with a global live satellite broadcast, using actually these new media, not for entertainment, but to point us to their poetic and also to their intercultural capacities. And I think that's very relevant today, you know, when we think about how we can bring technology into an organization like the Serpentine. It's not you know, to basically create entertainment, but it is actually to, to liberate these poetic and intercultural capacities which lie, you know, in, in, these, in these technologies. And we find that very fascinating and that's very exciting also in terms of these new experiments in art and technology Marcus is describing in the book. There is a whole chapter on Ian Chang and the character of Bob, of course, who, who lived in the exhibition. And these are all things we're going to discuss in, in, uh, in the conversation. In the book, of course, The Creativity Code will be the center. But I felt that it would be good to not just start with the book, so to not fall with, how do you say in English? To fall with the door into the house, <laughs> but actually to give a little bit of a, a prehistory, you know. And I always think it's important uh, to understand how an author gets to a book to kind of begin with the beginning. And of course, it all begins in a way with you becoming a mathematician. So I wanted to ask you the first question: How how did you come to mathematics, or how did mathematics come to you? Well, it was quite late, actually. I think people think that you're born a mathematician um, and that there's no hope if you, if you can't do it. And actually, I wasn't particularly into numbers until I was about 12 or 13. And then I had a maths teacher at my comprehensive school who pointed at me in the middle of a lesson and said, De Sotoy, want to see you after the class. I thought, oh, gosh, I'm in trouble. And um, then at the end of the class, he took me around the back of the maths block and I thought, wow, I'm really in trouble now. I wasn't quite <laughs> sure what was going to happen. But um, then he said, I think you should find out what maths is really about, because it's not about what we're doing in the classroom, long division, sines and cosines. It's something much more exciting. Um, and he recommended a few books to me, which it was like being given a key to a secret garden. And I don't know why we don't give all our kids this key, because um, I, started, I got these books, went up to, I live near Oxford, and we went up to Oxford, got these books. and. I just suddenly started reading the big stories of maths and realized that in school, what we were doing was learning kind of grammar and vocab and no stories. And this teacher had just suddenly said, there opened up these amazing stories to me. Um, so uh, actually I did a, sh a radio show with him much, uh, it's called Top of the Class, a BBC radio station where you get to go back and see the teacher um, that uh, inspired you and I asked him why did you pick me out did you randomly pick people out during the class and just see hope that if you do it enough times it'll stick and he said no I only ever did it with you and I said so why because I wasn't any better than any other kid and he said I could see you responding to abstract thinking and I knew the world of mathematics would be the place that you would just love to spend your life and gosh how much I have to thank that teacher for opening up this world but relevant to this was one of those books because one of the books he recommended was a book called A Mathematician's Apology by G.H. Hardy. And it's a short book written by a Cambridge mathematician. Um, I think it was written about 1940s. Um, and it, he describes what it's like to be a mathematician. And he describes it as being a creative artist. He says, you know, mathematics is it's not a useful science, it's a creative art. The mathematics that gets used to build bridges and buildings and things, it's the most boring bit of maths. And the bit that's really exciting is the kind of creative bit. And I think I was already hankering after something that gave me freedom to, to kind of, uh, to be creative, not be boxed in by just having to conform to what the physical universe around us is, is doing. I wanted a somewhere more exciting to play. Um, and I could see that, but I still wanted the kind of the logic and the security of the world, I think, of science and mathematics. And I just saw this is the perfect bridge between the kind of world of music that I was getting interested in, theater, 
and yet being still somehow uh, a very uh, rigorous discipline. And so for me, mathematics has always this kind of thing, which was a kind of creative art, and, and, but also connected to understanding how our universe works. And of course, I mean, we could spend years here to discuss, you know, these infinite areas of, of mathematics. I just thought uh, it would be interesting to hear within these infinite areas a little bit more which are the areas you, you are most fascinated by. Well, I think infinite is one of them, because I think uh, one of the things in that um, mathematician's apology, there were two proofs. Um, there was the proof that... Um, the primes, there are infinitely many <coughs> primes. And I was just so blown away by the power of a finite bit of logical argument to understand infinity. We don't know where these primes are, but we could show they would never run out. I think that was the, the, the fact that the human mind can conceive of infinity and manage it as, was something that really excited me. So. Actually, what I do now is to try and understand um, the theory of numbers, but also symmetry. So that's my big. Yeah. But I'm interested in symmetries in kind of infinite dimensional space, not in three dimensions. Well, that's kind of boring. But um, so, but I think that's an interesting challenge when it, you know, we're going to move to what impacts AI and computers. Computers traditionally have always been very finite at heart, but aren't humans as well. How come a human mind can? conceive of the infinite, and is that something that, um, uh, that a machine would be able to do? Um, how, how could it make that? But if we can, why can't it? So. And I made the list you know, of all, and I already read the list of all your, your books. It's a very impressive list of books. And I kind of want to ask you what led you to writing and, and what these books mean for you, you know, within the practice. And it would also be interesting to hear about how you came to this new book, to the Creativity Code, from books which initially have much more to do with numbers, which have to do with, you know, there's a wonderful book on symmetry, of course. There is also the idea of what we cannot know, the, you know, the un un unknowable. There is, again, an infinity, you know, a smaller book, how to count infinity. How did this all lead to the AI kind of theme? And, and how does a mathematician write about AI? Well, so I think my English teacher at my school would be absolutely horrified that I'm writing because I was absolutely rubbish at writing. I mean, that's partly why I did maths, because I, I'm a rubbish speller. But fortunately, you know, AI can now do the corrections of spelling for you. So that's great. You know, I love this age. Um, uh, but I think partly the reason I got into doing this, um, well, I almost didn't, because the opening line to a mathematician's apology is... G.H. Uh, Hardy says, it is a melancholy experience for a professional mathematician to find himself writing about mathematics. The role of a mathematician is to prove theorems, not to talk about them. So we've been living as mathematicians under this kind of specter of, um, you know, you just stay in your ivory tower, you just do your mathematics. But that's a paradox because he wrote the book. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, the whole thing is a beautiful paradox. So he writes this beautiful, he's the greatest counterexample to that whole thing. Yet it kind of put this atmosphere where actually mathematicians felt very nervous about um, sort of breaking outside of their discipline. But uh, actually, the reason I sort of started writing for newspapers and then it gradually grew into uh, the first book I wrote, The Music of the Primes, was partly to pay back my teacher and Hardy and the other mathematicians who'd written the books which kind of fired me up to to want to be a mathematician. So, so I wanted to... Um, tell the stories, not the kind of boring grammar. I wanted to show people um, there are amazing stories out there. And actually, the Music of the Primes was an interesting one because Fermat's last theorem had just been proved. And this was kind of like the great unsolved problem. Uh, and I think when it was proved, people thought Fermat's last theorem, well, gosh, they finished maths. It's all done. It's finished. There's nothing else to do. So I was quite keen to put back in the public imagination a big open problem. And we still don't understand prime numbers, our most basic indivisible numbers are still a mystery. Um, so it kind of makes sense why that book was there. But as you say, uh, I've gone on quite a journey and ended up writing this book now about creativity and AI. And, but still there's a very strong mathematical theme as well going through this book. And it comes back to that mathematician's apology, which is, um, you know, I've always, when, when um, 
Deep Blue beat Kas Gary Kasparov at chess in the 90s. I used to get this all the time. Say, well, you must be out of a job now because everyone thought that doing maths is a bit like doing, playing chess. Um, and certainly it's a good analogy, um, but I'd always used another game as my kind of protective shield because chess actually gets simpler as the game goes on because pieces get removed. So it's kind of not the right way round as mathematics gets more complex. And so we always had this other game, the ancient game of Go, Chinese game of Go, played on this 19 by 19 grid with black and white stones. You have to surround territory and make sure you aren't surrounded. Um, and this requires a lot of creativity, intuition, a feeling for where a stone should go, a lot of pattern recognition. Um, so uh, people probably know this story, but you know, a few years ago, AlphaGo comes along, developed here in London by uh, uh, DeepMind. Demis Hassabiz, yeah. Demis's uh, idea, you know, he, he was told actually at university when he was in Cambridge, um, Go is not something that a computer will ever be able to play. And you know, that's like a red rag to Demis. So um, he went away and said, I'm gonna prove them wrong. And, uh, and sure enough, they did. This thing demolishes Lee Sedol. And it put me in an existential crisis because this was the game I always thought was like doing maths. And then suddenly an AI can play this game. So, so it sort of started me off on this journey of looking at, well, okay, if it can do play this game, uh, and perhaps we should come back to this game because it, there's something very special that happened in this game, which I think is not just it winning, it was being creative. But it sent me on this journey to see, okay, well, um, what other things can it do which are creative? Can it do maths, which I believe is in creative? But then I thought looking at the other arts that I've always compared maths, you know, maths and music always go together. Um, maths and, and visual arts has a big connection. So I wanted to, and I, with, uh, uh, I've done events looking at sort of narrative and maths as well. Um, uh, and so that's partly it. But I also was on a committee, the Royal Society, and we were looking at the impact that machine learning was going to have on society in the next couple of years. And that, usually I hate being on committees. I mean, who, who likes being on committees here? But this is the one committee I always loved going to because I learned so much on this committee about um, the impact, the development of machine learning, AI, and uh, Demis was on the committee, so I was sitting next to him and sort of asked him what was going on. Uh, and really interesting people. And I just realized it's really important at this point that society understands what's happening because there's just something very new, fast developing um, in the last couple of years. And, and so this book is partly um, that early warning system. So it goes back to, uh, to McLuhan in, a, in a, yes. an interesting way. Yeah, I think so. Now, I have many questions about the book, but before that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the marathon, because you were in the AI marathon we, we organized, and in nine other marathons as well. And actually, it's also two of our co-curators of the marathon who have organized tonight's event. It's Lucia Pietro Justi and Kostas Stasinopoulos. Please give them a very big round of applause. <laughs> Running. And now we, we curated this uh, guest host host the Machine Marathon also with Ben Vickers and with Claude Agile, uh, where we considered the advent you know, of AI, of consciousness, of interspecies corporations, of machines. Uh, transhumanism was a theme. And you presented an amazing talk there. It was called How to Make a Zombie. Uh, and it was actually a, a talk inspired by, by your journey, really, to understand the science of, of consciousness. So I wanted to ask you to tell us and to maybe revisit that talk. It's very relevant to um, the kind of ending of this book because, um, you know, I think there's a big question. Yeah. Consciousness is one of the big unanswered, maybe unanswerable questions of science. Um, now, you know, I look out here and you all look pretty awake. Some of you are looking a bit zombified, but the real question <laughs> is, how can I know that you're not just an avatar being sent out? Perhaps you're you know, at home watching the rerun of the FA Cup final uh, matches. Um, how can I know that you're actually conscious? Well, I think what I do is, first of all, you know, I think that's partly the Turing test is about interacting with you. And, uh, but I think bottom line is that this idea of homogeneity. You are built very much like me, so I assume you have an internal world which is quite similar to mine. And of course, 
we're never sure of that. If we talk about pain, Wittgenstein talks a lot about, you know, how can we identify a word like pain? We can't point at pain. And so actually the challenge of knowing whether your pain is anything like my pain may be impossible. And how do we do that? Well, I think uh, the art that we produce is one way of trying to share our internal worlds. Um, but I think the real challenge is, um, is this thing here. Uh, you know, when my iPhone starts saying, iPhone think, therefore iPhone am, you know, where, at what point do I have to recognize that this might have an internal world? Um, so, uh, so the question is, you know, how can you tell whether something's a zombie or whether it really has an internal world? So zombie is a kind of philosophical word for something which is simulating absolutely what it's like, you know, on the outside it looks like it's got an internal world, but actually there's nothing going on inside. And so in the marathon, I talked about this experiment that I went to see in America, which was um, extraordinary. It was a sleep laboratory. For me as a mathematician, when I try and understand something, one of the best things is to try and understand when something isn't that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very good way just to look at the complementary thing. Um, so if you're trying to understand consciousness, why not try and look at something which is unconscious? Well, our brain flips actually between these two. You're all conscious at the moment, but when you go into deep stage four sleep, it's the most unconscious your brain becomes um, uh, naturally um, during the 24-hour uh, period. So is there an, a difference we can see in the way the network of the brain uh, works? And it turns out that if you, you can do this thing called transcranial magnetic stimulation, where basically you just switch on some neurons using a magnetic kind of pulse, and then you see what the logical implications of that in the network of the brain is. When the brain is awake, what happens is that you see this cascade across the brain. It sort of feeds to the edges, then feeds back to the original source, then out again. You get this kind of looping behavior. Um, it uses a lot of the brain. When you do it when it's asleep, it's just localized behavior. It's as if the network has gone down, the, mm. the kind of tide has come up. Now, this has led the guy who's been doing this experiment experiment, uh, Giulio Tononi in Madison, to come up with actually a mathematical formula for judging when a network might pass this threshold where it's starting to be aware of itself. Um, and he's been able to use this formula to cook up two networks which outwardly look will behave exactly the same. So they're two neural networks. And if you interacted with them, they both, the input and out, if you put one input in, they both give the same output. So just interacting with them, you wouldn't know any difference between them. However, one has no kind of internal feedback and Tononi believes has no sense of itself. It is a zombie. Whilst the other one it has an internal world because of this coefficient that he's got m measuring a higher kind of integrated behavior. This means that actually I could take any of your brains and there's just a, a, a formal procedure mathematically you could go through to, to rewire that whole network such that it has the same input output behavior, but yet nothing is going on inside. So it means then you would, you know, you actually have to go inside the thing to understand whether it's actually got an internal world or not. Um, so his kind of, who knows whether his uh, idea is actually capturing what consciousness is, but it's certainly a component of it. And I think for me, and this is part of the story I told in What We Cannot Know, um, I think it's the most exciting um, progress on consciousness um, that there has been in the sciences um, in the last couple of decades. And that, of course, leads us then to the book, because a few months after the marathon, you, you came to see me and we had a long conversation about art and you were interested in, you know, who are the artists who work with, with AI? We discussed Ian Chang. You, yes. you met Bob. The, uh, several of them. Yeah, several Bobs, actually. The AI creature who, who lived at the Serpentine for several months. And uh, it was a fascinating experience because it's the first time we actually had an exhibition at the Serpentine. And I do believe it's one of the first time that that has happened anywhere in the world, that actually an institution is, is, not, is, is taken over by an exhibition which has a nervous system. Uh, because this exhibition, you know, was basically the birth moment of Bob. And uh, if you read the, the visitor books, the, the, the book, the golden book of the exhibition, where people can, you know, digitally and also in an analog way leave comments about what they see, you really see the fundamental difference with other shows. I mean, somebody wrote, for example, I reread it this morning, and somebody wrote, you know, I traveled all the way from Birmingham 
to come and meet Bob, and I'm very disappointed because Bob ignored me. And, uh, you know, you would never read that about somebody visiting a painting in a museum, you know, and, <laughs> and, or a sculpture or photography or a video installation. And then somebody else said, you know, I came yesterday, you know, uh, to, to meet, it was a digital comment, you know, somebody posted that they came yesterday to meet, to meet Bob. And, we are so enchanted by the encounter because Bob was so nice to them that they're going to come back tomorrow. <laughs> and then at some point, uh, Jana and I got a, you know, got a message from, uh, actually from the parks that, that they were concerned that all of a sudden the gallery had lit up in the middle of the night, that the projections had gone on. And uh, so we were very too and started to find out what had happened. And what actually did happen is that Bob was programmed to to be awake from 10 a.m. when the opening hours of the, of the gallery start to 6 p.m. But one day, you know, Bob had decided to wake up at 3 a.m. And that means that the gallery is lit on. So that was Bob, you know, the house that Bob built. It was uh, basically to be with Bob at the summertime. So you came to see me a few months after the marathon. We discussed Bob. And, and you told me there for the first time that you're, you're working on this book. And um, art does play a very central role. You talk about different art experiments. You also talk about Desmond Morris, uh, <laughs> who is still alive, who is the, uh, the basically one of the last surrealists. He's in his 90s now and lives uh, in the UK and still paints and, and, and writes books. And he, of course, worked on you know, another form of, of artworks not created by humans, but artworks created by animals. The, the famous, uh, you know, Congo chimp uh, paintings, uh, which uh, you you describe also in, in in the book. So I was I was kind of wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how the book is structured, because it's not only about art. We also yeah. learn about the Miss Hassabis, about the Go experiment. It all begins with another test. It begins with the Lovelace test. Actually, that is the first uh, example where you quote Claude Debussy, where Claude Debussy said works of art make rules. Rules do not make works of art. And uh, of course, there is this uh, amazing story of the machine being a thing of beauty, towers of gears with numbers on their teeth pinned to rods, rimmed by a handle that you turn, where the 17-year-old Ada Byron was transfixed as she cranked the handle of Charles Babbage's machine to watch it crunch numbers to calculate squares and cube and even square roots. So it would be great to hear a little bit how it all begins, about why the Lovelace test marks the beginning, and how you then structure the books with art and science and many other things. Yes, well, it's very interesting because Ada Lovelace, the first uh, person to consider um, writing programs to get this machine to do things, but she was also one of the first to think, well, maybe these machines uh, can do more than just uh, calculations and, and mathematical yeah. calculations. And she talks about the possibility that they might create music. Um, so partly she's there as uh, one of the first to conceive of the idea of these machines m making art. But I also put her there because uh, she puts a word of warning. And I think this is really crucial to this whole debate, which is, yes, but these machines can only do what we tell them to do. So even if the machine creates something like a piece of music, then surely we should be crediting the person who wrote the code as the truly creative person. So the, the Lovelace test, um, uh, which you know, a number of people have proposed this idea of a Lovelace test, um, is the challenge of uh, at what point do you have to recognize that the code has actually broken away from the coder? And the code is starting to do something which the person who wrote the code is really not in control of and did not expect. And it's, uh, and I you know, I quote Margaret Bowden as a, as a good definition of creativity, that creativity should be something new. Well, machines can easily create new things, but it should be surprising and have value. And it's that kind of surprise to even the person who wrote the code. Um, so I think that's the challenge with something like Bob. Bob, uh, you know, was, uh, was Ian Cheng, uh, surprised by Bob kind of waking up in the middle of the night? Uh, I think he was, because he wrote code which 
changed and adapted uh, such that, you know, there are six bobs by the end. They all start off the same. Um, but uh, what's interesting is the interaction of the, the person in the gallery changes the parameters inside Bob such that Bob starts to do things differently in, in different rooms. And therefore, you, you know, how much is the Bob actually something that um, he was expecting in each of those? And can it, so I think the art in this is to create code that allows um, a kind of learning process. And that's, I think, what the sea change is and why I wrote this book now. I mean, AI is a very old subject by now, going back to Turing. But now something very exciting is happening because the, the code is able to um, learn from its interaction with the environment. So it's a bit like AI of the past is like a parent giving uh, birth to a child. Yeah, the child's DNA is completely determined by the parent's uh, combination, um, but then wasn't given anywhere to, to play. And so the child never develops and is always somehow just still the product of the parent. Now AI is the, the code that's being developed changes, mutates, and, and, and evolves into something new because of the interaction with the, the digital kind of world around us. And that's why I think there's something really exciting going on where there could be that kind of difference. Now, I quite like to, uh, I'm going to come back to the structure of the book a little bit, but I think there's something really interesting about Ian Cheng's piece compared with the Gerhard Richter you mentioned. Because I think if you're going to try and meet this challenge of something unexpected appearing out of the AI, how are you going to do that? Um, one of them is to kind of take Gerhard Richter's route, which what he did was the, with the uh, 4,900 Farben um, is he, so I don't know whether people came to this exhibition, but it's um, basically uh, the exhibition that you held was the version where you have a 10 by 10 grid. And, I mean, they're actually, the canvases are five by five grids and uh, Richter puts them together in different ways. So you can put four five by five grids together to make a 10 by 10 grid. And he, in the five by five grid, he randomly chooses um, colors to fill in the, the pixels. And he genuinely does it randomly. And um, you know, he had a, a bag and he pulled it out. Now, randomness is a very interesting way. And, and early attempts at AI art very often tried to create the surprising uh, thing output by putting randomness in there. So the, the, uh, the algorithm making some decisions, which a lot of artists talk about, when you look underneath the bonnet, there's no decisions being made. It's just a use of a random number generator. Now, I don't think that's particularly interesting form of creativity. Um, Richter, I think, is making comment on randomness. That's why that exhibition is interesting. Um, because when you look at the exhibition, you try and find meaning in all of these kind of pixels and things like that. But Ian Cheng's is different because he's actually setting up algorithms which I think are deterministic if I understand correctly, um, but chaotic. So it means that a very small change in one of the gallery spaces will send one bob going off in a completely different direction. So mathematical chaos theory is about uh, a deterministic system where if you perturb the input uh, a little bit, then the output can be, can be completely different. So this means that you re if you have a chaotic system, you really do not know what the output is going to be because it can be a very s subtle small change it's completely determined, so it's, it's already entailed in the uh, definition, but you can have a very surprising output. Um, so I think it's very interesting, that tension between chance and chaos being used as a kind of element in an AI to create something uh, which is uh, it kind of meeting that surprise element. Now, the structure of the book is kind of interesting because Running through it is this existential crisis of mathematics. And so mathematics kind of bobs in and out uh, and trying to see whether, well, if it can play Go. I mean, I offered Demis a challenge. I sat next to him at this committee meeting and I said, um, you know, okay, we were sitting in the Royal Society. And I said, well, all right, could you, get, could you get an algorithm to become a fellow of the Royal Society? Um, we'd just both been elected. So I thought, you know, uh, and he, he said, I'm already on the job. I thought, oh my God. And so, so I went down to deep mind. And there's part of it's about uh, the story of the book is um, trying to understand uh, what they were doing and, and whether what they are doing is something that I think is mathematics. Um, uh, and so woven between here is then, actually the book starts with trying to give people a kind of backstage pass to what an algorithm is. And I think it's so important. This is this early warning system. We are being pushed and pulled around by algorithms. And unless we understand how they work, you know, it's the program all be programmed. 
most of us are being programmed and we don't realize it. So there's a kind of element of this which is trying to use this journey to empower people to understand how algorithms work. And that's why, you know, the work marathon this year, I tried to under, uh, unpick a kind of algorithm which is pairing people up, a matching algorithm um, kind of on dating agencies. So you can make sure you get the best date. So if you understand it, you can hack it. And um, um, but, uh, but then it goes through. So I, so I actually started with the visual arts um, uh, as, you know, the big breakthroughs in AI and algorithms at the moment have been visual recognition software. And I made a program for the BBC about uh, um, AI about five years ago. I think it was a Turing anniversary. And at that point, I was really disappointed by what AI was doing. And one of the big things was AI does not seem to have any sense of visuals. It can't see the big picture. It just gets stuck in pixels. And that has been just cracked open. And amazingly, because of this machine learning, we now have extraordinary uh, visual recognition software. So, so the story about um, AI and the visual arts is, is, is the first kind of art story I tell. But then the second one is about music, because maths and music have always been connected. Music is a very abstract world. Surely that's somewhere, it's about patterns, it's about, isn't that somewhere where AI might be very successful? Um, but I, my end, actually, with the, um, with, uh, the written word. And I was most surprised the written word I think is the most challenging for AI. Um, I think that it's getting quite close to visual uh, stuff and music, but it doesn't seem to have be able to get anywhere close to being doing anything other than kind of local uh, language generation. But I have maybe I don't know whether this might be a good time to try our little AI Turing test. So that would be great because I just actually my next question is also about Turing. So maybe we can okay, focus yeah, on so that and then do the test. Yeah, sure. Because of course, you know, Turing, uh, I was rereading again today the paper, you know, he wrote, I think in mid-century, must be around 1950. It's a, it's a very seminal paper <laughs> called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And, and in that paper, he introduces the concept of what is now known as the Turing test to a general public. So like you, he wanted to communicate science, you know, to a wider, to a wider audience, to a wider public. And there is this famous question there, can machine think? And, and you, of course, ask the question, can machines be creative, which we've already addressed. So I suspect that your interest, just as it was for Turing, lies not so much in finding a definite answer, but in examining what the question itself might mean. So I wanted to ask you, before we go into the tests as a kind of a segue, um, I wanted to ask you how you address the relationship between consciousness and creativity in the book. You've already alluded to it, but it would be great to hear. And then also then to tell us about the tests and to do it. Yes, sure. Uh, it's interesting because uh, you know this Lovelace test is actually, um, in a way, trying to do opposite of the Turing the test. The Turing test is, um, you know, can you create, say, a chat bot which is so convincing that you, you think you're talking to a human? So it's trying to replicate human intelligence. Well, it's actually the Lovelace test, uh, the creativity test there, is to try and create something which is sort of not, is, is uh, kind of disconnected from the human. It, it's trying to do something which isn't, uh, you know, something new for, for that. Um, I think the test is, you know, we want to make it sort of far away from having its source in the human. Um, and I mean, I think you, you mentioned consciousness there, and I guess that's the kind of conclusion of the story. I think that, uh, that the art that's being produced, it's very interesting. Sometimes it's about trying to, the Turing test is trying to pretend to be a human. So a lot of the AI art early on is trying to pass itself off as perhaps um, an, another human production. So, uh, so that's what I'm gonna do here is to show you some pieces and I want you to see, well, can you distinguish the things which are created by humans and which are created by, um, uh, by machine. So let's, let's try that. So um, uh, if we could have, there's, so the way you're going to do this, if, if you usually get told to put your smartphones away, but this one is a talk where you're allowed to have your smartphones on. So what I want you to do is, um, so if we could get uh, the, um, this up here, there's a website I want you to, to log on to. So you're going to be voting on these things, okay? And then hopefully we'll be able to get the data live up on the screen. Um, so Hans Ulrich, you can do this as well if you want. So, um, so what you have to do is to enter just this uh, website address. So it's a piece of software called Glisser. Uh, so it's G-L-S, 
r.it um, and then forward slash creativity code. Uh, creativity code. Good. And, um, and then, uh, so what I'm going to do. Uh, Um, so here are two paintings. Um, Rembrandt. Uh, one of these is Rembrandt, and the other one is uh, not Rembrandt. It's created by an AI, which it's interesting. The machine learning needs a lot of data to learn on, to learn the style. And so Rembrandt did a lot of portraits. And so he, uh, there's a lot of data to learn on. Um, and so uh, one of these is taking all of that data and creating a new Rembrandt. Um, so I'm going to send you these. Um, so now you should get little pictures coming up on your uh, mobiles. And you want, I want you to press which one do you think is not the human, which is not by Rembrandt, but which is by um, uh, the AI. What's interesting is that you know, one way to do this, you could take all uh, the Rembrandts and kind of um, average them out or something. And that's actually what Galton tried to do. Galton, the, the eugenics guy, he said, I wanted to try and get a, a, uh, what a typical criminal looks like. And he took lots of photographs of kind of um, ra uh, rugged looking criminals and things, kind of disfigured faces. And he averaged them out. And um, what he got was a very beautiful face. Because if you average things, you get something uh, which is quite beautiful. So this isn't, that in, isn't an averaging. What it's doing is picking up the way light is being used in Rembrandt's things. OK, so let's see. You should uh, managing to get your votes through, do you think? Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, so, uh, 67 percent of you, 64 percent, um, think that the the one on the left is the um, AI Rembrandt. So the red is the one on the left, and so, so you can see it's not uh, you're not convinced completely. So it's, it's obviously working on some level. That you know a third of you, uh, because actually you are right. Um, so uh, the, the, the 65 percent that is the one. So the one on the uh, this one here is the, the one that is the AI one, the one on the, the left. Um, so again, there we are. So 66% of you can feel good about yourselves that you haven't been taken in by the AI. I won't ask Hans Ulrich. Um, uh, um, uh, actually, no, which one, did you, you? Yeah, I found it was obvious, yeah. And so what gave it away? I think, I mean, in a way, I was kind of thinking about one thing, you know, which is it has to do maybe with something um, and that's a kind of a deeper question I actually wanted to ask you later, but we should do it now. Because I think it has to do with mortality infinitely. I think machines might not understand mortality, which is what I think, you know. And was that um, bleeding through in there? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think somehow. And I think, you know, in a way, art has a lot to do with mortality. But what do you think about that? Well, I, th I think it's very true. I think I, the reason I do mathematics is because I want to leave something very permanent behind. And I feel that of all the creative arts, mathematics is the thing, you know, the proofs that I've created um, have a permanence about them whilst, you know, these paintings will decay, but mathematics does not decay. I mean, it's kind of, uh, so it has a big permanence. So I think mortality is very much part of um, this. But, uh, but also I think there's something, unfortunately, I think a lot of the, these AI art projects I found were just adverts for people's technology. And I think in this case, you know, what's the point about creating another Rembrandt? Unless you can understand Rembrandt more deeply because of this, which is a possibility. And, you know, there's some very interesting examples in the book where, um, you know, AI visuals are starting to see things that we have missed. Um, or even not just visuals. Uh, there's a very interesting, the Netflix algorithm, which recommends what you want to watch next. Um, it just took the likes and dislikes of people and started to group together in categories. And when you look at the way it's kind of dividing up the terrain, you can see sometimes, oh, yeah, those are all comedies. I can see why that's, they're all grouped together. But sometimes it was seeing, through our likes and dislikes of films, almost new genres. They were dividing films up in ways that I don't know what it's seeing there that connects all of those films together. It's almost begging for a new word to classify what the AI is seeing. So I think that's what's exciting in, in taking a, a AI and making it look at things from the past, maybe helping us to see new things in Rembrandt. Um, uh, but I think actually the most exciting thing is about creating new stuff. So here are four paintings that are done by uh, artists in, uh, who were displaying in uh, Basel uh, in last year, I think. 
uh, or the year before last, and four of the paintings were done by um, uh, an, an algorithm. Um, and so actually they were displayed at Basel and uh, the reactions of the public in Basel were, uh, were quite surprising. They found the AI art um, uh, quite moving. So what I want you to do is, so um, is it the four on the left which is done by AI or is it four on the right which is done by AI? Um, so there, you've got uh, a chance to vote on these now. So um, are four paintings on the left a created by AI or the four paintings on the right? Um, you think it's uh, some bit of debating going on at the front here. Um, uh, I think this is quite an interesting project because actually these are created by not one algorithm but two algorithms um, that compete against each other. So one algorithm took all of the art of the past and learnt the different genres of paintings and it was tasked with trying to create and a piece of work which couldn't be classified in any current known genre. But it, was, it had to keep within the bounds of what it had learned was acceptable as art. So it couldn't push out and just do a complete mess. It had to be recognized as art. That was the creating algorithm. The discriminator algorithm was then up tasked with saying, OK, no, look, I recognize that style. You haven't moved far enough. Or no, that's way too, that is not art. That's something just a complete mess. And it was, um, uh, algorithms are very good when they're competing against each other. So this is something called a, a creative adversarial network, which created four of these paintings, um, which kind of by uh, working against each other pushes the, the thing out of the realm of what is known into something new. Okay, let's see how you're doing on this one. Um, okay, so uh, a big vote for um, the ones on the uh, left uh, right being your, yeah, my, uh, uh, and uh, are you right? Yes, you're absolutely right. So um, a very discerning audience. If you're coming from the Serpentine, I was not expecting anything. Um, <laughs> and, and again, I suppose, uh, you know, there is, uh, would anyone like to say what gave it away for them? What gave it away? Yeah, what, what gave this? this the paintings on the right all are, look very self-referential. Ah. Interesting. Okay, great. All right, so that's your, your art one. So what about a bit of music? Okay, um, so I've got two, two pieces of Bach. Well, actually, one piece of Bach and one piece of Bot. Um, you have to work out which one is which. Um, so, uh, so we're going to start with it. There are two chorales. So we're going to first start with the first chorale. Um, so here's your second chorale. Is this one the Bach or was the previous one the Bach? So now your chance to vote. So, uh, so press on the left one if you think the first piece was Bach. It uh, was the AI Bach, sorry. Press the one on the l left if you think that was the, um, the one created by a, a, a bot. And press the one on the right if you think the second piece was the one created by the bot. So you've got to press the one you think is not really Bach. OK, let's see how you're doing. Um, so 59%, uh, 61% of you, 60, oh, right. Now, now, are you all being influenced by each other? Um, oh my gosh, they all think I'm changing my vote. Uh, um, so you think you're going for the set code, so the way pie charts unfortunately um, go around like uh, clockwise, so red corresponds to the one on the, the left and the orange corresponds to the one on the right. Um, so, uh, well, let's see what you did. Um, so the AI bar is the second one. So you're, you're doing pretty well at this. Well, you're feeling very, very pleased with yourselves, aren't you? But still, pretty, pretty um, uh, tough challenge. Okay, so uh, Bach's pretty easy. And actually, 
Bach chorale is the most boring bits of Bach out. I mean, he had to pump, pump these things out because they were like hymn tunes. So, um, uh, so let's try something a little bit more interesting on the music. Now, I have one question about the music. Because yeah. I found this quote uh, this morning in the book where you write, music has always had an algorithmic quality to it, which means that all of the art forms it is most under threat from uh, are the advances of AI. And it's interesting because, you know, in a way, we're working actually with Gerhard Richter again at the moment on this project for the, for the shed in New York City where with Alex Putz we brought together Gerhard Richter and, um, and Steve Reich. It already started with when Alex was in Manchester at the Manchester International Festival where we brought together Arvo Pert and, and Gerhard Richter. But of course, Steve Reich has worked a lot with serial, very algorithmic music. Yeah. Uh, he then tried for many, many years to, uh, you know, successfully to get away from this serial music and do different kind of music. But Richter brought him back to his early work because Richter was always very fascinated by his early seriality. And they collaborated now on this installation where Richter was doing new pattern works, uh, wallpapers, but also with Corinna Bell's a film. So he actually starts to animate, you know, these 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 pattern. It's again control chance, and yep. and then Reich made a composition of 40 minutes of music, um, basically in answer to. So they, they, it was like a feedback loop. They they yeah. worked. That will be presented next month for the first time. Oh, it's really exciting. Where these two yeah. things come together. So it's the kind of next chapter. But I just want to ask you a little bit more about this algorithmic quality of music, and and if you really believe that it's the art form most under threat. Well, I think that um, the reason I say that is because I think um, music isn't easily translated into something else. It is almost it's a self-contained system um, that, uh, you, you know, it, it isn't, as Stravinsky used to say, it's not saying anything. Uh, and so what is, uh, many people will say, but I'm having a huge emotional response to this. What do you mean it's not saying anything? Um, but yet, I think, you know, the, if you look at um, the way, if you talk to way composers compose, um, they, you know, I quote Philip Glass, in a, I, I did an event with Philip Glass, and, you know, he, I talked to him about his process, and his is very algorithmic, learnt from, actually, time spent with Ravi Shankar and understanding the way Indian music works. Um, and I think he, he has a lot of algorithms there. Um, and actually, almost the challenge is, when you're listening to these, you're almost trying to, reverse engineer what the algorithm is, and they're, they're very hard to kind of unravel. But he said, no, I don't put, program any emotion into this. The emotion comes out of those patterns that I've put down there. And so one of the things I suggest in the book is that although we say there is, you know, I have an emu a huge emotional reaction to, to this piece of music, what I think composers have tapped into is that they've almost managed to code up in a different form our, our, our emotional world that this is code for the emotions that we're feeling. And so when you replay that code, it, it triggers, you know, what is emotions in our head? It's a particular configuration of uh, neuronal activity. Uh, and so the music seems to be almost a, like a low level projection of the huge complex crystal that corresponds to sadness or something in our heads. Um, and when you look, I just did an event um, uh, on a Saturday at. Uh, the, in the Barbican about um, actually celebrating Gerd Lescher Bach, the, uh, it's the 40th anniversary of this um, kind of iconic book, um, which I grew up with as a, as a student. And in there, uh, it's kind of described that Bach's, the way Bach writes, I mean, I call him the first coder, not C-O-D-A, but C-O-D-E-R, because a lot of the ways that he builds complexity out of simplicity is by little algorithms. And the musical offerings is a perfect example. This is a piece he wrote for Frederick the Great, um, and he wrote it as little puzzles. He wrote one line of music, and then there was some sort of code that the king had to decode, which said, oh, why is there a clef upside down at the end of the music? Oh, because Bach wants me to play the piece of music forwards, but with my second hand, he wants me to turn the piece of music upside down and play it backwards. Um, and the, it's the kind of combination. But it's a very simple, that's what, code is about. A simple ingredients, an algorithm, and then suddenly complexity appears. So I think Bach is always where um, AI starts. So I tell a story about deep Bach. At the moment, anything AI gets deep put on it. It's sort of, um, uh, so um, I even have sort of deep AI toothpaste, I think, at the moment. But, um, uh, but, I, but, uh, but the interesting thing is that if, if 
It's about pattern recognition. This is what AI is very good at at the moment. So if you take something like Chopin, it's harder to see what the algorithms are there that are making Chopin in the way that you can see them with Bach. Um, but with Chopin, you can still see patterns. I mean, why when you put on the radio, I, you know, I can very quickly, I mean, having been immersed in classical music, I can very quickly say that piece of music is Chopin. There are key things being given away about the style of a particular. So if AI can take the whole of Chopin's mazurkas and can learn those things, why can't it then start to stitch those back together? What AI has a challenge with is often it's, and I found this all the way through, it's very good often at very local behavior. It can stitch together words to make quite convincing series of sentences, but it's really bad at global structure. And so although it can do mazurkas in quite short form, to do anything big is a real challenge for it. But anyway, here are two mazurkas. One is um, by AI and one is by Chopin. So let's have the first mazurka for you. And here's the second mazurka. So is this the AI one? the left, or was the second mazurka AI press the right? I think it's pretty impressive that the AI can, can do Chopin, actually. But, I mean, the, the, and I, I think the chorales are pretty... Writing a chorale is a bit like doing a Sudoku, actually. It's sort of, you know, filling in the and it's kind of first exercises com composition students get. OK, let's see how you're doing here. Um, so 66% of you think the second one uh, was the AI one. So let's have a look. No, it was in fact the first one. So th this is the first time I've managed to push you over to the other side. A few gasps at the front here. Um, and, and I think, you know, it does pretty good. You know, that's it's quite sophisticated, that sort of flourishing at the beginning. So um, good. Um, Should we do some poetry? Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. Poetry? Can you spot? So here are some poems. Which one of these are AI or what? Okay. I think we're coming up to poetry day. Uh, soon. So, so you get, here's your first one. Mortal my mate, bearing my rock. You were also in the poetry marathon. Yes, I was. No, I wasn't. That was the Is one, that the one, one you I missed? wasn't. Yes, the one I missed. Uh, I, uh, yeah, should have been there. Yeah, yeah you were yeah. rot that day. That's rot, a drama. Rot, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's this one. Is this AI or is this human? Mortal my mate, bearing my rocker heart. Warm beat with cold beat company. Shall I earlier or you fail at our force and lie the ruins of rifled once a world of art? Okay, I'll get you to vote. I'm not going to read all the way. OK, is that bot or not? So your chance to vote. Was that a bot or was that a human writing? I've got three bits of poetry for you. So that's the first one. Um, so let's see how you're doing. Um, uh, so you all think that's a bot. OK, interesting. I'll, I'm not going to tell you at the moment. Um, so here's your second one. Uh, so this one's, their smallnesses of the curved, discrete, warm blunder felted, is the title. There are smallnesses of plasticide reaction, of real time, of packs, of displaced exclusionary yeah, heart, hurt, of powerlessness, magazine fired, non dignified, as head fatty implied, internalized violence, of frozen helplessness, of white. Okay, do you think that is human? or AI, so bot or not. Now, is he messing with our minds? Because that looked like black code to me. Um, OK, let's see what you're thinking. OK, you think that that's actually human. You're probably thinking that I'm, you know, why would he put a load of code there? It was like, OK, well, uh, OK, so you've done that one. OK, here's this, your last one. Imagine now the dark smoke awaken to fly all these years to another day. Notions of tangled trees, the other side of water. I see it is already here. Sequences of her face see it is shared, and old friends pass their dreams. Okay, is that 
bot or not? Tricky. Is it a trick or is it tricky? Perhaps they're all bots. Or that could not. be a new TV show, bot or not. Bot or not, it sounds like, yeah. Little time. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, let's see what you're thinking. Okay, so you're, you're, that's more the Brexit vote coming up now. Um, you're a bit undecided about that one, but you're mostly going for bot on that one. Okay, um, is that right? Yes, you're mostly going for bot. But um, so let's see. Okay, the first one you were pretty universally thought was a robot. Um, no, it was General Badly Hopkins. Poor old Gerald Manley. I mean, Gerald Manley Hopkins is always, I've never understood anything he writes, frankly. <laughs> um, uh, second one, of course, you got right. You thought that was, you know, he couldn't put all that code up without it actually being. So this is a woman, uh, an Australian poet, who's very interested in actually the way code ha has its kind of own kind of internal poetry about it. So she's exploring the kind of way that there might be, you can use this language in a kind of poetic way. And the last one is actually a bot. Um, so you were just on the right side. Um, this is Ray Kurzweil's uh, cybernetic poet. So Ray Kurzweil, who one of the first to talk about the singularity. Um, so, oh, right, okay, I've got a last one. So my challenge in this book was whether I was gonna get put out of a job as a mathematician. So actually, I managed to discover, um, here are four sequences of numbers. Three of these are created by humans, um, but one of them, it was actually discovered by um, an AI, and it, it's quite a creative kind of act. So, um, so the first sequence is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. Next one is 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21. Next one is 1, 2, 5, 15, 67, 504. And the last one is 1, 2, 8, 9, 12, 18, 24, 36. Now, you might be doing this randomly. I don't know, but how many mathematicians are there in the audience? I wonder. Some of these you may recognize. So I, I'm, I'm going to send you that one. So you now, I think, get a chance to press on. Um, I think you press on. How is that coming up? Is that coming up? Yeah, so you, yeah, you get the list, so you can press it. So is it um, the one where the next one is just you add the two previous numbers together? Is it the one it's actually adding up all the numbers from 1 to n? Or is it the one, the number of objects with a certain number of symmetries? Or is it the one where the number of divisors of the number divides the number itself? Let's see how you're doing on this one. Um, so most of you are going for the, the symmetry one, the blue one, and uh, a few of you are going for that last one. Probably 7% of you are going for the Fibonacci numbers. So obviously you haven't read Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, because that's like the first sequence in there. Um, so which one is it? It is, in fact, that green one, the last one. So um, uh, actually, the one you think is done by a robot is actually my own creation. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Oh, that's, that's kind of depressing, isn't it? Yeah, OK. Well, I think that's really interesting, working out how many. But it, so, so um, it was kind of. Uh, interesting, but ultimately, when Demis, I went to talk to DeepMind about what they were doing, and I was very disappointed because, uh, and this is, as you use the story of the Library of Babel as a kind of metaphor, Borges's um, beautiful story about a library which contains every single book that is possible to write, because I think sometimes this is what AI is doing. It's trying to create all the things which might be possible, and it's not very good at making choices. And so when I talked to Demis, it turned out that what they were doing was getting a machine to churn out proofs, you know, new proofs of um, theorems. And they seemed to, they increased the number of theorems from 53 to 56% that could be done by a computer. But I felt this was like the Library of Babel. They were just creating all theorems that are possible. And this comes back to what we began with about why is maths a creative subject? Because I write theorems like this one about that you thought was a robot, is, um, is I write theorems to move myself and to move my audience. I write, take people on a journey with my proofs where I want to, them to go, wow, I didn't realize that was gonna happen. How, those two things are connected. Oh, you've taken me to a completely new world. I tell you a story using numbers and geometry and mathematics, and there's a massive amount of choice going on in the stories that I tell. I think people think that mathematicians are trying to create a library of Babel where it's just all true statements about mathematics. But actually, we're trying to tell stories, and I'm trying to choose those pathways through the mathematical world 
which I think will excite the audiences that I talk to in seminars or um, so. And that's why I actually ended with um, uh, a narrative and, and storytelling because I think that actually is the closest to what mathematics is about. Um, and so the fact that AI is finding telling stories really difficult gave me hope that still it, I'll, I'll have a job to do as a mathematician. And how do you see it, and this may be, before we open it, one of my last questions, uh, are you rather optimistic or pessimistic in terms of the impact of AI, not only on your profession, but on society, you see? Because what is interesting is, I went to Harvard the other day um, for the launch of John Brockman's book, which is Possible Minds, 20, 25 Ways of, of Looking at AI, and I contributed the text there on art. And, and AI about, you know, Hito and Ian and different other artists whose, you know, whose works are Trevor Palin, whose work connects to, um, Susan Treister also uh, connects to, to, to AI. And it was interesting because all of the authors of this book were asked to do a very short statement. So it's kind of a format of, you know, three, four minutes talk, like a, a polyphony. And so, it was really very divided. Some were optimistic and some were very pessimistic of the impact it will have on the society. I mean, uh, Max Tegmark has a particularly you know, uh, critical vision of it yeah. because Tegmark believes in a way that uh, there is this danger of a future you know, society with super intelligence. And, uh, uh, and in a way, he really says you know, the only solution is that we work towards a friendly AI because the outcome might either be an unfriendly AI, which will end up destroying humanity, or a friendly AI, which will you know, make everyone better and, and uh, make the world safer. And, and, um, uh, and of course, in a way, we need to learn from mistakes, from lousy strategies, he says, we've had in the past. And so it's a quite, you know, alarmist position, and, and I was kind of wondering, yeah. uh, and I, not alarmist, but a wake-up call. You know, it's, it's, it's a wake-up call. Tag Mark's text is a wake-up call that we need to act now to avoid that this becomes an unfriendly AI. So I was wondering, what is your view in terms of AI and the broader impact on, on society? I think uh, I've read so many dystopian stories of AI um, and the books that are written uh, I would say uh, m more towards the negative. And I actually try to make this more of an optimistic book. Mm. So I am optimistic. And, and I think particularly in the realm of the creative arts, because I think s some of the most exciting stories were showing how AI can help us to behave less like machines. That I think we get very stuck in particular ways of thinking, especially creatively, actually. We, we do something and it sort of works, yeah. and we just keep on producing the same thing over and over again. And so the best stories were where AI showed um, an artist a, a new possibility for their own work. Um, one of the best examples was a jazz musician who, um, there's something called the jazz continuator, the continuator, and essentially it learns the kind of uh, world of the riffs of the jazz musician, and then plays back something in that world to, to the, like in a call and response yeah. method. The jazz musician who played with this said, well, I recognize that, that's all my world, but I've never ever thought of doing that before with this. And I kind of use this uh, uh, kind of, vision of like the jazz musician is in one corner of the room and there's just a little light on the jazz musician and, and he's playing away over there. What he doesn't realize is there's a huge room that he could play in. Um, and the AI, I think that's one of the positive things is that the AI can open up worlds of possibilities for us uh, as human uh, creatives. I think this, what Techmark said is very interesting and one of the I think the best way to get an empathetic art, uh, AI, is for AI to learn on our world of art, actually. One of the most exciting stories was, um, I used to love these books as a kid where um, you were, they're kind of like game bo books where you were given a choice of which direction to go in. You know, if you want to um, uh, go through the right door, turn to page 37, go through the left door. I mean, you probably watched Bandersnatch on, uh, you know, on Black Mirror. So you get your chance to make the, the movie. And I, when I watched Bandersnatch, it kept on coming. Out, come on, come on, you want to kill the dad. Come on, kill the dad, kill the dad. And I was kept, no, I do not want to kill the dad. And I kept on trying to push it. And eventually it was the only choice I had left was to, mm. to kill the dad in the episode. Now, 
AI has been trained on the way we tell stories and then was given one of these kind of tree of possibilities to tell its own story. And what was encouraging was because of the way it had learnt on the stories we told, the story it chose was less dystopian and more humane um, than if it had just been done randomly. And I think that's, um, I think Max is absolutely right. We need an empathetic AI. And uh, that to be empathetic, you have to get them to the mind of the other. And the art that we produce is perhaps one of the best ways to get into the mind of the other. Um, and it, uh, I end actually um, uh, with Ian McEwen said uh, after 9-11, um, if the hijackers had been able to imagine themselves in the, the minds of the passengers, they would not have been able to do the, um, the terrorist act that they did. Um, and, and so I think Max is kind of right that we need to get the, the AI inside of the mind of the human. But on the other side, I think that we need to learn what the mind of the AI is going to be like. And I think uh, increasingly this AI is, I think will eventually become conscious. And when it becomes conscious, we're going to, it's going to be a very different, we won't be able to use homogeneity to understand each other's consciousnesses. You're very built like I am. I presume it's your very, your internal world is like mine. This internal world is going to be completely different. And there are already examples. You absolutely said, as Paul Clay said, um, art is, makes the invisible visible. Or some of the best, kind of, some of the worst art is the deep dream art that Google kind of generated. But in a way, it's the best art because it allows us to see how um, visual recognition software sees the world. How did it learn? What is it, you know, as AI becomes uh, more disconnected from the coder, we're going to need to know why it's making the decisions it is. And when Deep Dream was just told to, to dial up, well, what are you seeing in this random sequence of dots? And it started to show its internal world. I see well, what did it learn on? It learned a lot of pictures of cats on the internet. So a lot of cats started appearing. Um, but it also, you know, for example, uh, it started seeing dumbbells, but those dumbbells would always have an arm attached to it. So you realize that it only ever learnt on pictures of dumbbells that were being picked up and down. It didn't understand there was a disconnect. And I think this is the really dangerous thing going forward, that we think AI and algorithms are kind of neutral, value-free, because they're a piece of mathematics but they're learning on data, and that data can have a huge bias in it. Um, and I did an event at Wired last year with um, uh, uh, a woman from MIT who's a roboticist. Uh, she's black, and when she went in front of the robot software, the software didn't see anybody there until she bought a white mask on, and then she was seen. Um, and then she, when she looked under the bonnet, she saw, well, this thing, this visual recognition software has just learned on white male faces. And so it's got a bias already in there. So I think that by looking at the art that AI can produce, is we can, can somehow sometimes unpick that bias. She now has something called the Algorithmic Justice League. And I think that's very important. We should all join the Algorithmic Justice League. And I think art might be a very good way to make the invisible visible and, and help us to understand how this AI is thinking because it's beginning to move away uh, from Ada Lovelace's idea that it'll only do what we tell it to do, because no, it's doing things which are new. I love this conclusion. There's, there could not be a better conclusion than the invitation for us all tonight to join the Algorithmic Justice League. Marcus, thank you so, so much. <laughs>